In this video, I'm going to discuss all of the different businesses that I've had over my life, and I've done a whole lot of different things. Um, for most of my adult life, I'm 38 now, for most of my adult life, I have been self-employed. So, um, so there's lots of different businesses. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was seven, <laughs> and look at what I looked like. I was such a little nerd. <laughs> Those big old glasses. <laughs> so um, it, I started my business by accident. Um, I, I got hamsters for, I think it was like a, a birthday or a Christmas, I don't quite remember now. Now it's been so long ago, but I got a pair of hamsters and uh, it so happened that they started having babies <laughs> and they had a lot of babies and their babies had babies. <laughs> and eventually my parents were like, what are we going to do with all these babies? Because I didn't, I mean, I, I wanted to keep the hamsters together so they'd have a friend and so they kept multiplying. <laughs> On one of the visits in to one of the pet stores is we lived out in the country. Um, my dad uh, and me, we, but most my dad on my, my behalf asked the pet store owner if she would want to buy my hamsters <laughs> and so that's how it started I remember I got a dollar for each hamster baby and they, they were grown up and they weren't sold for like food for other animals they were sold to people as pets and so what I did and the deal I made with my parents was that if they let me continue to like have this little hamster farm in one of our spare rooms in our house that I would with my profits off my business I would pay for all the you know things like the 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 hamster litter that they needed to have the food and all of that so as it turned out it, it wasn't a very lucrative business for me the hamsters basically just paid for themselves and I used some of the money to buy more hamsters because <laughs> I liked hamsters when I was 17 I'm almost 18 like two months before I turned 18 I started living on my own and I was trying to juggle college and I was working at Sonic Drive-In at the time and I was also working nights um, um, at this place that um, was a rehab house uh, for people who had uh, like mental disabilities and things and it was just too much I, I was working so much and I, I just I couldn't handle it <laughs> you know but I had to to pay my bills and so um, so when I was turned 18 shortly after I decided that I would go be an exotic dancer uh, because the money was so much better I could work two days a week a total of 16 hours and make three times as much money as I was making working two jobs and so it, it was no-brainer for me at the time plus it was my next um, job as being an entrepreneur because as an exotic dancer you work for yourself you are considered an independent contractor so you make your own rules basically you don't I mean the, you have to comply with some of the club rules and guidelines but for the most part if you don't want to give somebody a, a lap dance or something you don't have to I worked as a dancer off and on for like a couple of years there um, from the ages of 18 to 24, 25 ish. I would work for a month or so and then I'd quit doing it and then another few months or so and then quit doing it basically. Exotic dancing wasn't for me. I mean, it was really lucrative, but I have a lot of health issues um, which cause me joint problems and so I can't physically handle doing it. And so starting at the age of 24, I quit being a dancer. When I was 19, um, while I was an exotic dancer, I met a guy named Todd Skinner. I I've I've written a book about this and I've done lots of interviews and things like the interview on Vice uh, with Hamilton Morris. So I'm not going to go into all the details here, but if you want to learn more about that, there are resources in the description area of this video so that way you can find out more about that. Uh, but I I'd met Todd and uh, he had a, a you know, a never ending supply of drugs to sell. And so and that's what he did for a living was sell drugs. So he taught me how to sell MDMA and supplied me with MDMA and so I became an MDMA dealer. I did this off and on for a couple of years there um, but by the time by 2003 um, he was no longer in my life and I finally had cleaned my life up and gotten away from him but being a drug dealer was another one of my experiences with entrepreneurship. I remember after I was trying to get out of being a dealer and I was trying to not be an exotic dancer anymore I, I was trying to reform my life <laughs> and I remember there was this old hippie and he told me something really great and it was that all the skills that I had from being a drug dealer, I could transition those into running a small business. And it's a lot of the same things. He's like, so if you can be this successful of a drug dealer, then you have no problem. You can be successful in business. And he was so right. And, and, and in hindsight, I look back on those times in my life and I know that 
it's so much easier now now that I've had a real business and not been doing shady shit to make money <laughs> I realize that it's so much easier to have a real legitimate business than it is to be a drug dealer but you think the opposite like for me I grew up in poverty and so I always thought that I didn't have a lot of opportunities and so I needed to go the shady route in order to get up in life I, I didn't think that I could start a business with nothing and make a middle class income when I was 23 I started writing my first book my and this is the first edition copy if you see it on Amazon you'll see new book covers and things because I've put out um, a couple new editions since this book this book was went into print in 2005 and it has one of my paintings on there it's one of my very first paintings <laughs> um, but yeah so I wrote this book and when I wrote this um, this is my another one of my ventures in entrepreneurship because I I'm self-published and I self-published this before it was really a trend to self-publish now a lot of people self-publish um, it's much easier but back then it was harder to find a self-publisher and um, well, I tried to get it published but I experienced so many people saying no well I, I mean I was 23 when I wrote it and one of the biggest things that I got from people you know I was 23 and 24 when I, it took me about a year to write it so I started when I was 23 and then I finished it when I was 24 but I had so many people who I would show the book to and try to let them read it and stuff and they'd be like look I mean why are you writing a book how do you know anything about life to write a book from I mean you're only 24 so I feel like I experienced a lot of age discrimination <laughs> um, and also I mean I you know I, I, I had been on a lot of drugs before this I mean as evidenced in what the topic of the book is about <laughs> um, and so you know I was kind of scattered probably and I didn't know anything about business or doing a legal business I just knew I had all these crazy experiences and stuff that people would love to to know about and love to hear about and experiences that could help others and spread awareness um, about the positives and negatives of using psychedelics and living the lifestyle that I did. So, uh, so I wanted to share that and I thought, you know, yeah, well maybe I can also make a profit off of this and I can turn it into a business. But I quickly found out that being a self-published author is, is no good. I mean, you don't make very much money, or at least I didn't at first. Um, I realized that I had to promote myself, and I didn't have a clue how to do that. So at the time, um, in 2005, when this came into print, um, I wasn't selling hardly any of them. I made myself a website, and I was also still dancing at a club called Baby Dolls in Topeka, Kansas at the time. And so I was selling copies of Lysergic on the floor of the strip club. Um, hope, I mean, I needed money. I had to, I, I needed money. So it was kind of like I would sell them to anybody I could come across. And I was selling dances. I was selling books. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy thing. <laughs> but it was, you know, it worked. So I sold several hundred copies of my book as while I was dancing there at Baby Dolls. <laughs> um, but then I injured my knee. And uh, this was when I was I think 25, 24, something, 24, 25, I don't know, I think 25. But anyway, so I injured my knee and then at that point I couldn't dance anymore. When I couldn't dance anymore, I tried to figure out what I could do for a living and I applied to all sorts of jobs and people Googled my name and all that promotion I had been doing online um, with, putting my website out and everything. I hadn't created the NeuroSoup YouTube channel yet at that point, but I was still trying to promote myself. And I was doing a good enough job that anytime a person Googled my name, Crystal Cole, Lysergic would come up and they'd hear about me using all these psychedelics and I couldn't get any jobs. I applied to 300 different places and I had an associate's degree, so I had an education. I didn't have much of a job history. I mean, I was a drug dealer and an exotic dancer for the whole time from 18 until 24 off and on, or, or I had, you know, I was living with, you know, people who supported me. I didn't really have jobs, so I had no employment history, but I did have a degree, but it didn't get me any jobs. So then I was like, well, great, you know, I, I was living in poverty. I was on food stamps. I was like, what am I going to do? I had no one to help me. My family wasn't going to help me. They didn't have any money and they didn't care to help me. So it was kind of like, I had nobody and it was serious problems I mean my life was like at rock bottom and so I started like racking my brain what skills do I have what can I sell and I realized at the time this was 
2005 or 2006, um, at the time in my area where I lived, there were a lot of small businesses trying to get websites on the internet and then the companies around there were charging like so much money and I could do it for a lot less than them. I mean, I was willing to work for a little of nothing. <laughs> and so with no money, just a laptop and willing to float people credit. So I would tell companies, hey, I'll do your website for you for free up front. If you like it, you can pay me for it fifty dollars a month for one year until it's paid off. I mean, I like I like I was working for little or nothing, so it was win win for them. I mean, if it turned out good, they got a cheap website <laughs> because they were paying two or three thousand dollars for what I was selling for six hundred dollars. So I, so anyway, I started getting customers that way, and I taught myself as I went how to design websites. And um, I got books on HTML. I read you know read all these things. I I went down to Barnes and Noble and read them. I didn't buy them because I was too broke. <laughs> Um, but I would go down to Barnes & Noble and I'd get books on interlibrary loan from the library and I would watch what video tutorials were available on the internet at the time. But I ended up teaching myself how to design websites for people and I, 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 sl I started to move on to where I was doing bigger and bigger websites. So then in 2006 or 2007, somewhere around in there, I started the neurosoup.com website and I did it primarily uh, because I wanted to advertise my book Lysergic and I wanted to spread more educational resources. and, uh, and but I thought it'd be kind of cool to connect with people. But then I realized that no one was going to the website and I had worked all this time on it. No one was going there. And so I thought, I saw this news program about YouTube and this was 2007. And I was like, oh, I can do that. I mean, I already talked about all these drug experiences in my book and I haven't gotten in trouble for it yet. So, <laughs> and the statute of limitations are slowly running out on these things. So, okay, I guess I'll just, you know, I guess I'll just go for it. And so I started doing YouTube videos and I realized that, you know, I was the only one on YouTube doing anything like this. And so this was my next foray into entrepreneurship was being a YouTube creator. Um, and so I was doing all these things because I wasn't really making very much money doing any of it. I, I was just kind of spinning my wheels. I mean, I, I would get web design jobs here or there and they'd be bigger and better than before, but I was still working for so cheap. You know, I, I wasn't raising my prices or anything. So it was kind of, it was hard to, to make a lot of money off of it. And, and I got my YouTube channel monetized and, um, people think that I made lots of money off that, but I didn't. The most I ever made off of monetization in a given month on my YouTube channel was $600. And I only did that for maybe a six month time period or eight months. And then it was back down. Most of the time I would just make like two or $300 off a month off my YouTube channel. It was never very good. I was getting millions of views. So I don't know. I, I think it was because I had drug videos and advertisers don't really want to advertise um, on drug, chan drug education channels. So who knows, but, but that was my experience, at least uh, with monetization back in the day. I don't know what it's like now because I don't have my channel monetized. So shortly after I started doing my YouTube videos and the NeuroSoup website, I also wrote a book after the trip and it talked about my life after doing all the psychedelics that I talked about in my book, Lysergic. So this was my second book. Um, since then, I have published three more books, um, two of which well, one under a pen name, um, which is a sci-fi book, and I'm not advertising it here. Um, I don't, all my haters like to go on my Amazon and put bad reviews, and I have great reviews on that book, and it sells, so <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you guys what it is so my haters can go find it <laughs> and hate on me about it when they don't even read it. Um, but, and then I put, published a couple more books about psychedelics, um, two, one, MDMA for PTSD, which is a download. Um, it's an ebook uh, available on Amazon. And then um, another book, um, The Neurosub Trip Guide, which is out of print currently. So by the time I was about age 30, I started getting more and more interested in my art, which you can see this in one of my new paintings back there and art in the background of the video and all over my YouTube channel. So I'm not gonna show any more of it on here too much, but, but I did start trying to figure out how to sell my artwork. And it was so hard to figure out how to make an art business succeed. I mean, you always hear the saying starving artist and man, I mean, I was <laughs> like, I had to keep all this stuff going to try to keep, to try to do art too. And I was just juggling all this stuff and none of it was really working <laughs> until I did my very first art fair. And it was this really small little art fair um, in Winfield, Kansas. And the booth fee was like 50 bucks. And I ended up, so I paid 50 bucks to set up my art fair booth there. And I ended up making $550 worth of sales. And I was like, oh my God, that's the most money I've ever made in a day since I was a drug dealer or a stripper. <laughs> And so I was like, this is awesome. I actually can make it as an artist. And so then it was like, okay, so I knew that there was money to be made. 
and but I didn't really know how to do it yet and it it took me a couple more years of doing art fairs and trying things out and figuring things out before I really figured out the right mix of things to then start saying okay like I can really do this so on the screen I'm showing some pictures of my art fair booths that I had I, I, what I do now is I do big art fairs uh, they have to have at least 25,000 people attending or more uh, my favorite ones are art fairs that have like 300,000 people or more um, and those are because you can get so many people through your booth and it really uh, it makes your level of income go up and, and I'm all about making the most money you can for the least amount of work I mean you know it's work smarter not harder and, and that's one of the things I've learned uh, since uh, you know in my 20s I just worked hard I didn't work smart really I just worked hard I did everything I could to try to make money <laughs> and I didn't really make a lot of it I mean you know, I lived in poverty for most of my 20s but then when my 30s I started realizing okay I need to figure out like how to monetize something and make a good amount of money off of it so I started thinking about it differently and I started high grading what I was doing and also thinking about what was making me personally feel happy and fulfilled because it, I know that if I'm passionate about something I'll keep doing it <laughs> and, and I want to do more of it and that's what I wanted my art to be at. I didn't want it to feel like a job I wanted it to be something that I could do every day and I could just be so enthusiastic about. When I was 35 about three years ago I started my art gallery in Town West Mall here in Wichita and so that was my first experiment with having a retail store full-time in a mall. So that was a whole different experience for me. Before I was an artist who toured around and went to lots of different events but I didn't really have a full-time you know seven day a week retail business. Now my gallery at the mall was only open on weekends so it wasn't every day of the week either. Um, during the Christmas season I would be open more days but since I worked there primarily on my own by myself I did all of it. <laughs> I just I couldn't be there all the time and paint and you know, do my shipping and receiving for my internet side of my business. So it was kind of, I had to manage my time. I know my video has went on for a while, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, but because, uh, you know, now I'm 38 and I no longer have my art gallery in the mall. I've closed it down because of coronavirus. Uh, but aside from that, I'm still planning to be doing art fairs in the future where I travel around and set up my art fair booth and I have my art for sale online. And so primarily now I'm focusing on the online uh, section and portion of my business because, you know, I, as I see it, like, especially for artists, it's important. You know, the saying, you should have a lot of irons in the fire, right? <laughs> you should have a lot of revenue streams as an artist if you want to succeed. And so right now I have one. It's, it's anything I can do online. But normally I would have my online, I would have my retail store, I would have my traveling gallery ex exhibitions, I would have also I do a wholesale and lots of I, I wholesale to zoos and and like small boutique dog and cat kind of stores with my prints. I still do that but there's just not as much retail sales happening right now so so a lot of my wholesale is kind of dropped off as well. Um, so yeah so now I'm trying to figure out I'm learning how to pivot my business uh, into a different direction. Direction. But what I do want to say is that I have built, last year I had a six-figure business with my art. So you can go from nothing. I mean, I had nothing. I had all these businesses, no money to invest in any of them. And I kind of used what I was making from all the different businesses to bootstrap the next businesses and then keep going. And I just, I, I did a lot of work. Um, to be able to make it happen. But then, you know, at, at the culmination of it, I was actually able to earn six figures in one year. So it's pretty cool. In future videos, I'm going to discuss more about business and how to succeed as an artist, because I think I have a pretty unique perspective on being an artist and how to make money and, and I've succeeded at doing it. So um, regardless of coronavirus or not, I mean, it's gonna eventually end and there are going to be a lot of things that people can do to make money and you can make money right now. I mean, art is selling online right now like crazy. I know I need to wrap this video up, so I think that's about all of the entrepreneurial experiments I've done in my life. I mean, I don't know, maybe there are a few others, but I can't think of any of them off the top of my head. Say hi, buddy. <laughs> all right, see you guys next time.